The Italian Mafia has become a firm part of American culture, with its modern structure of the five New York families being established in 1931 at the end of the violent Castelmarisi War. Italians began immigrating to America in large numbers during the 1870s. And while the Sicilian Mafia may have existed for centuries in the Old World, it was not until the 1890s when Italian criminals in America began to become organized. The first Mafia family in New York traces its humble beginnings to immigrant Giuseppe Morello, who adopted the English name of Peter. One of his hands was deformed into a claw which earned him the nickname The Clutch. Peter Morello entered New York in 1892, and the following year, three of his half-brothers crossed the ocean to join him in East Harlem. In 1897, they formed a gang called the 107th Street Mob. They quickly began to dominate Italian neighborhoods in Manhattan and the Bronx. The group became allied with Little Italy crime ward Ignacio the Wolf Lupo. Morello's half-sister married Lupo in 1903, and the two gangs became united as one family. They would make money through protection rackets, gambling, stealing, numbers, and prostitution. Another favorite source of income for the group were black hand letters. A black hand letter was a preemptive ransom note informing a target that harm would come to them or their loved ones unless a payment was made. One of their trademarks for dealing with rivals and threats were what became to be known as barrel murders. For a barrel murder, a victim would be killed and their body would be stuffed into a barrel for concealment. On some occasions, the barrels would be shipped using fake names to non-existent addresses in faraway cities where victims would become unknown John Doe's and likely never solved. But most of the time, they were left in areas for people to find with the body parts of the victims dismembered. The body in the barrel would become a calling card to remind the public that the Morello family were not afraid to murder in order to get what they wanted. During their first wave of power, Peter Morello became allied with powerful Sicilian mafioso Don Vito Cassio Ferrero and the two began an international counterfeit money operation. Fake U.S. currency was produced in Sicily and shipped to Morello, who would then distribute it. By 1909, Morello was undeniably the boss of bosses of the Sicilian-American Mafia, with many soldiers and captains working under him. But 1910 would mark the high point of Morello and Lupo's power. They were arrested for their counterfeiting operation, found guilty, and each sentenced to 25 and 30 years. The 1910s was a period of turmoil for the Morello family. A war was fought with the Camorra organization, Italian gangsters from Naples based in Brooklyn. It would be deadly and destructive for both sides between 1915 and 1918. The war ended with the decimation of the Camorra and the remaining survivors surrendered and integrated into the Morello family. But the Morellos also lost a lot of men, including their then leader, Nicholas Taranova. With a weakened central management, some powerful captains decided to split away and turn their factions into new and independent families. Thomas Rena left in 1920 with territory in the Bronx and East Harlem. His new empire would eventually become known as the Lucchese family. Salvatore d'Aquila split from the Morellos in the 1910s and initially had territory in East Harlem and the Bronx before later spreading into Lower Manhattan and Brooklyn. By the 1920s, he was New York's newest boss of bosses. His organization would become known as the Gambino crime family. Another prominent captain at the time in the Morello family was Joe Mazzaria. As Mazzaria grew in power, d'Aquila became more and more threatened by what remained of the Morello family. In 1922, D'Aquila preemptively struck out against the family and murdered then-boss Vincenzo Terranova. Masseria filled the vacuum, becoming the new boss, and proving the wisdom of the old expression, you're better off with the devil you know. In 1928, Masseria had D'Aquila ambushed and murdered on Avenue A in Manhattan. He was succeeded in leadership by Masseria's ally, Manfredi Minio. Peter Morello was released from prison in 1920. Although he was recognized as the founder of the family that bore his name, he was no longer acknowledged to be the boss. Morello might have thought otherwise, but the threat of D'Aquila to both him and Masseria forced both men to become allies. By the end of the conflict, Morello realized that Masseria was firmly in control, and he was offered the position of being Masseria's consigliere. He accepted that position, and during the Prohibition years of the 1920s, he became very rich. As the 1920s passed, Masseria began to call himself the boss of bosses. But this high point would not last for long as Italian immigrants from the Castelmarisi Gulf region of Sicily arrived in Brooklyn and were establishing their own families that would soon become powerful rivals. A war was coming that would completely reshape the Mafia. At its end, the Morello family would be transformed into the Genovese family. The Castelmarisi del Golfo region of Sicily is unique from the rest of the island, with their own dialect plus a Mafia group that is independent from the others. As with other regions of Italy, immigrants left this region in the late 19th and early 20th centuries to settle in the United States, with most entering through New York City. A small amount of these men had ties to the Mafia, and they established their own clan in Brooklyn. Some prominent early members of this clan were Nicola Shichiro, 
who was the boss, and Vito Bonverte, a powerful captain who became very rich through bootlegging and legitimate businesses. Another early member was Stefano Magadino. He came to the United States when he was a boy and became involved with the group in his teens. In 1917, when he was 25 years old, he was involved in the murder of rival gangsters. To avoid charges, Magladino fled to Buffalo and joined up with a Castel Marise affiliated family there. Five years later, in 1922, he became the boss of that group. Castel Marise clans were also operating in Chicago and Detroit by the end of that decade. In 1920, future legendary crime boss and Stefano Magadino's cousin, Joe Bonanno, immigrated to the United States to escape fascism in Italy. He tried his hand in legitimate work as a baker while also operating a side hustle of having a home distillery in the early days of Prohibition. In 1925, another Mafia legend named Salvatore Maranzano arrived in New York. According to Joe Bonanno in his autobiography, Maranzano also fled Italy due to Mussolini. But others say he was sent to New York as an emissary of the Sicilian bosses on the island to consolidate and take control of the entire Mafia in America. Maranzano was accepted into the Castelmarice family immediately due to his status back home and he was made a captain. He made a small fortune in bootlegging which he then used his profits from to invest in real estate. He was well acquainted with Joe Bonanno's family and took the young man under his wing as an enforcer and coordinator. Maranzano had an interstate network of distilleries, each with its own manager. Bonanno became responsible for coordinating the supply and transport of materials for each location. He was also responsible for investigating any problems that occurred like arson and hijack shipments. Bonanno claimed that after the information was passed up to the boss, it was out of his hands and someone else that he didn't know took care of it from there, according to his book. We will never know if this was actually Maranzano compartmentalizing his organization so that no one ever had the full picture, or if Bonanno was lying because there isn't a statue of limitations on murder. Bonanno became very close with the Old World Mafia captain, and they had a mentor-protege relationship. But after a couple of years, despite their closeness, Bonanno was not a made man of the family and was only an associate. Seeing the fortune his boss was making, and himself becoming a little rich, Bonanno decided to invest his capital into a larger distillery in Brooklyn that was something more than just a simple bathtub operation. As the business began to make money, it started to attract attention. One day, a man named Mimi arrived, demanding a cut of the money because this was his neighborhood. Emboldened from his relationship and experiences with Maranzano, Bonanno stood up to Mimi, who he only knew as a stranger, and the two almost got into a fight. Unfortunately for Joe, Mimi was a main member of the Castelmarice family, and Joe was not. But fortunately for Joe, he had a powerful relative in his cousin Stefano Magladino and a powerful friend in Salvatore Maranzano. While a normal civilian would be squashed in this situation, a sit-down was granted under the judgment of Vito Bonverte. Magladino and Maranzano attended and spoke up for Joe. Maranzano argued that while it was Mimi's neighborhood, Joe was his guy and Mimi should have checked to see who Joe was before he went in there with his demands. Bonverte ruled in favor of Joe and he was allowed to keep his operation. This put Joe in Maranzano's debt, but he didn't mind at all. Shortly after this, Joe Bonanno became a made member of the Castelmarice family. Meanwhile, Joe the Boss Masseria was busy using violence and intimidation in an attempt to consolidate the American Mafia to be completely under its control, whether directly or through proxies. The disruptions began in Chicago when Masseria backed Al Capone and his organization in an attempt to take over the entire city's bootlegging operations. Opposing Capone was Castelmarice gangster Joe Aiello. Aiello was not powerful enough to take on Capone alone, so he allied with Irish gangster Bugs Moran. Before fighting broke out, a sit-down was arranged with Masseria, Capone, Aiello, and Detroit boss Gaspar Malazzo to find a settlement. But none could be arranged, tempers flew, Masseria walked out, and Chicago went to war. Masseria was known to be tough, vicious, and brutal. His advisor and number two man was Peter Morello, the original founder of the Sicilian Mafia in America. Morello was believed to be the actual brains behind Masseria's organization. They tried to adopt a divide-and-conquer strategy over the various Castelmarice families. They warned Malazzo not to get involved with Chicago, but he refused. On May 31, 1930, he was assassinated with a Masseria-approved successor replacing him. In New York, Masseria knew of up-and-coming Captain Salvatore Maranzano and arranged a meeting with him that both Morello and Joe Bonanno attended. At the meeting, after some flattery over his success in America, Maranzano was warned to stay neutral or his good fortune may not stay so good. Maranzano, knowing that he was not strong enough to fight right now, humored them and backed off. Shortly after, Masseria demanded that Castelmarice boss Nicola Chichero pay him a tribute of $10,000 to remain in his good favor. Chichero paid him the money and then fled to Italy in fear. Maranzano realized that Captain Vito Bonverte was a target because of his strength and wealth, but Bonverte did not yield to his warnings. He was killed a few days later at his home in front of his garage. Maranzano had a reputation in Sicily as a warrior and he knew that the only acceptable solution for the Castelmarice was to fight back. 
he spoke with Stefano Magadino and received his backing to be the new boss. The Castamarise family was in chaos. A family meeting was held and everyone debated about what to do next. Maranzano spoke up at the meeting and rallied everyone that the only options were to fight back or lose everything they built. Maranzano was then elected to be the new leader of the family. It was now up to him to create a strategy to fight back and what happened next would be remembered in history as the Castamarise War. There are only two first-hand sources for the conflict known as the Castelmarice War. One was Joe Valacci, who was the first made member of the Mafia to turn state's witness. He was a former thief and getaway driver that was recruited as a soldier into the Marizano faction. The other source of information was former Mafia boss Joe Bonanno, who wrote a tell-all memoir in 1983 that became a bestseller. He was the right-hand man of Salvatore Maranzano since the beginning of the fight. Bonanno painted the conflict as a war of self-defense for Maranzano and his Castelmarice brethren. Joe the boss Masseria and his second-in-command Peter Morello were trying to seize control of the entire Italian-American mafia, and anyone standing in their way was going to be killed. In Chicago, they were back in Al Capone in his war of control for the city, while in Detroit, they assassinated hostile boss Gaspar Malazzo and installed Chet Lamare as his replacement, which sparked fighting in that city. Meanwhile, things were going much better in New York. Caetano Reno was founder and boss of what would become the Lucchese family. He was a former captain in the Morello family who broke off on his own 10 years earlier and he was no fan of Joe the Boss. On February 26, 1930, Reno was murdered outside of his mistress's apartment. It's suspected that future powerful mob boss Vito Genovese was the hitman. In Reno's place, Masseria installed Fat Joe Pinzolo and he considered this family to no longer be a threat. Along with the Provacci family staying neutral and the Castelmarice family in chaos after the abandonment of their boss and the death of their most powerful captain, Joe the boss considered New York to be under his firm control. But unknown to Masseria, Maranzano was elected to be the new boss of the Castelmarices, and he was prepared for war. Maranzano's men rotated between a network of safe houses that were supplied with food by some members of the family while other members supplied guns and ammunition. Maranzano traveled in an armored car convoy with American-born mafia member Charlie Di Benedetto as his driver but they only hit the road when it was absolutely necessary. Marzano pitched the war to others outside of his family as not for the survival of the Castelmarice, but a way to end the tyranny of Joe the Boss. His first outside ally was Rina family captain Gaetano Gagliano and his second-in-command Tommy Lucchese, though that all needed to stay secret for now. By the summer of 1930, Maranzano gathered enough strength to fight back and he attacked with the deadliest first strike that he could launch. Masserina and his allies were confident in their strength. Using taxi drivers as spies, Maranzano learned that they were not in hiding, and every day Masseria's number two man, Peter Morello, was going to his office with two bodyguards. On August 15th, they were ambushed and murdered in East Harlem. With this death, hostilities heated up in New York and the bodies began to drop. As the fighting intensified, Joe the boss was unable to depend on his ally Al Capone for support because Chicago was in a brutal war of their own but that didn't stop rumors from spreading. Word got out that Capone was gonna send men to New York. Joe Bonanno learned that these reinforcements were gonna be at an office building in Manhattan and he planned to ambush them there. The day before the shooting was to take place, Bonanno and his crew picked up fresh machine guns from a dealer. Fresh meant that they could be discarded and not trace after their use. They went to the office building and loosened the hinges on the door so that they could be easily kicked in when needed. As Bonanno returned to the car, he and driver Charlie D. Bendetto were stopped by the police and the guns were found. The cops were watching the gun dealer for an unrelated investigation and saw Bonanno pick up the weapons. The police tortured both men but they didn't talk, and when a lawyer hired by Maranzano arrived, he was outraged to find the brutality that Bonanno and Di Benedetto endured. Eventually, the police dropped the charges in exchange for the brutality to be forgotten about. After Morello's murder, Masseria went into hiding. Joe Velacci was tasked with renting an apartment in a building where Joe the boss was suspected to be holed up in. In October, Velacci sent word to Tommy Lucchese that he saw the target and a hit team was assembled. After days of waiting, they didn't see Joe the boss, but they saw his ally and new number two man, Al Menino, boss of what would become the Gambino family. He was with his underboss, Steve Faringo. Both men were ambushed in the courtyard and slaughtered. Soon, members from the Mineo family were defecting the Maranzano. One was future Gambino boss, Vincent Mangano. As the year ended, more and more people were abandoning Masseria. Al Capone won his war in Chicago, but even he was hesitant to support his former sponsor when defeat seemed likely. As 1931 opened, Masseria became more and more dependent on his lieutenant, Charlie Lucky Luciano. Eager to see the war end, Maranzano declared that his conflict was with Joe the Boss only. He vowed that he would not seek vengeance on his supporters or soldiers. This peeled more allies away from Masseria, and the goal was to get someone to betray him. That happened in the spring when Luciano and Vito Genovese sought out a meeting with Maranzano that Joe Bonanno witnessed. He called it a classic Sicilian conversation, where every word carried implications, but nothing was said directly. 
you know why you're here? Yes. Then I don't have to tell you what needs to be done. No. How much time do you need to do what you have to do? A week or two. Good. I'm looking forward to a peaceful Easter. Maranzano received Luciano's assurance that he would deal with it personally. Maranzano made it clear that if he failed, then Luciano would be his enemy. On April 15th, 1931, Masseria was murdered in a Coney Island restaurant with a full stomach. Luciano went to the bathroom and the gunman entered to take care of Joe the boss. Now that the war was won, it was time to win the peace. But before we do that, it's time to remind you, the viewer, to click subscribe if you're enjoying this video. And now, back to the story. It was said that after this, Maranzano declared himself to be the boss of bosses. But Joe Bonanno, Maranzano's protege, claims that was not true. There was a vacuum left by Joe the boss's absence, and Maranzano filled it while considering himself equal to the other bosses. A meeting was called to establish a new state of affairs. Maranzano was recognized as the boss of the Castelmarice family, and his underboss was Angelo Caruso, a captain who was instrumental in the recent war. Frank Scalisi took over the Menino family, and Gagliano was made the official boss of the Rina family after killing Masseria appointee Fat Joe Penzolo. Luciano took over Masseria's family with Vito Genovese as his second, and the neutral Provacci family remained recognized. All the leaders were allies in some form to Maranzano, and he was the central victor of the war. He was considered the strongest man in the group. A large national meeting for the bosses of all the families in the United States was called in May 1931 at Wappingers Falls, New York, to let everyone know how New York City stood now. Maranzano provided the security. No weapons were allowed and no one was allowed to leave. If they needed to use the bathroom, then they needed to be escorted by one of Maranzano's men. Maranzano had everyone sit at a long table. A plane circled overhead to scout for police cars, but Maranzano told the group that it had guns and bombs to scare everyone. He rearranged the seats and then said one side is honest men and the other side is dishonest. When men protested, he said enough. The past is gone and we should move on with peace. Maranzano proposed that the families be organized in a legion structure. Upper management, captains, and their soldiers would all be made men. Anyone who was not a made man would be considered an associate. The ritual of becoming made was adopted as official for this new formal and secret society. Families were all capped at their current membership levels in order to prevent an arms race and future war. After this conference, peace seemed to be achieved and everyone relaxed. But Bonanno observed that while Maranzano was a great war leader, he was a mediocre statesman during peace times. People started to recognize he had a temper that would flare up. Tensions were also brewing between Maranzano and Stefano Magladino. Before the war, the latter man had more prominence than the former, but that was now changed. Maranzano also had an aristocratic way about him that was off-putting to others. In September, Maranzano was murdered in his office by a group of men that were posing as IRS agents. In his book, Bonanno claimed that he was completely unaware this would happen. The Castelmarice family went into chaos with uncertainty. Because of his role during the war, many looked to Bonanno for guidance. Bonanno was elected at a family meeting to become the new head of the family. Luciano offered an olive branch to make peace and claimed that he had Maranzano killed in self-defense. It was verified that Maranzano hired Mad Dog McCall to take out Luciano, but Lucchese tipped him off and Luciano got to him first. Weary of fighting another war and unsure if the men in his family had the endurance to carry one out, Bonanno decided to accept the peace. While Maranzano might not have directly called himself the boss of bosses, the implication was clear. For many of the younger Mafia members at this time, they saw that this created a power imbalance amongst the five families, which would only one day lead to more fighting. To prevent this, Luciano proposed an American solution, a board of directors, which was called the Commission. The Commission consisted of all five New York families, along with Stefano Magadino in Buffalo and Al Capone in Chicago. At their meetings, all disputes and business between the families would be settled and some rules were formed like a made man and another family cannot be killed without the commission's permission. Also, it was agreed that a boss could not be killed without the commission's go-ahead. With Maranzano gone, Luciano forced Frankie Scalisi into retirement and Vincent Mangiano took his place. From this moment in 1931, the modern Italian-American mafia was born. While the Castelmarice War has been described not only as a conflict between Masseria and Maranzano, but also a generational war between the old mustache Pete's like Maranzano and the young Turks like Luciano. But Luciano was only about 10 years younger than the two bosses, and Gagliano and Mangano were older than Joe the Boss and Salvatore Maranzano. The end of this war should be defined as a conflict between those who came of age in Italy and those who came of age in America. The Italian gangsters preferred to stay in Italian neighborhoods and only do business with Italians, while their American counterparts saw a country that was the land of opportunity with the possibilities to scale their rackets appearing to be endless. Luciano decided to betray Joe the boss because he lost confidence in the man's ability to lead. These same flaws existed in Maranzano and became obvious to his camp after he won. Cosa Nostra might mean our thing, but in 1931, the Italian Mafia became assimilated into the American culture. In the end, the Castelmarice War can be lumped up into the greater American experience. 
where we are all a collection of cultures from across the world thrown together into one melting pot.